Deadly, but I think we'll get started. Everybody's enthusiastic and ready for world domination by Android. Fantastic. So our speaker this morning is uh, um, Jonathan Oxer, and he's been hacking on both hardware and software since he was a little tacker or a little hacker, one of the two. And he loves bridging the gap between the two worlds. Over to you. Hey, thank you. So, I'm going to be spending pretty much all of the time today talking about Android, but I'm going to start a little bit differently. I'm going to start talking about the iPhone. So, the iPhone has been a juggernaut, obviously, in the smartphone space. It has uh, really captured people's attention, and uh, every time there's a new release, there is a queue like this in the street. I think this was for the iPhone 3G in Boston, from memory. People are just go crazy about it. They're really obsessive about it. And it's really shown um, that there is an enormous market and interest in a device that provides um, a lot of common functionality that's the same for everybody, but also a lot of personalized functionality. And you see that in the breadth of apps and things that are available. It's not just software, though. There are also accessories and other things that get added onto it, including some rather crazy ideas. So this is not actually a <laughs> real product, but it should be. <laughs> I'd buy one. Um, and there are some that, yes, <laughs> let's take a nice little device and turn it into a desktop phone. So with a device like this, it's reasonably conceptually simple. If you think about this from a technology point of view, it's basically a case and some audio interface and some other things like that. It's not all that um, world breaking. You could, you could imagine not too, with not too much difficulty how that's designed. But there are some really interesting, very vertical, very specific applications as well. And things get interesting once you start using the phone itself as a control surface, uh, not simply taking some audio output out of it. In this case, it's an amplifier, which is fair enough. So you take the audio output from your phone or MP3 player and play it out through speakers. But it's also using the control surface of the phone to talk to the amplifier. So you can do um, parametric um, <coughs> adjustment and things like that from the phone itself. So this is where you start to um, get into the more specialised communication and where it becomes more difficult to develop these sorts of peripherals. And the way um, this happens, there are really a couple of parts to it. Apps themselves, uh, you become a member of the iOS developer program. And what a lot of people haven't heard of, and this is where things are more interesting from my point of view, is the MFI program, so made for iPod, made for iPhone, etc. That is where you... Uh, sign up with Apple essentially to produce a device that attaches physically. So we're talking about not just writing an app, but creating a device that interfaces to one of these products. And there, there are some people that have done some really interesting things. So <laughs> um, you don't want to end up like the guy in the picture after a big night out. This is a breathalyzer that you attach to the bottom of your iPhone. Uh, they, it has a obviously an alcohol sensor uh, that analyzes the, um, the alcohol content of your breath. So you clip this thing onto your phone, blow into it, and it tells you your BAC. So this is really getting down to the crux of it. What we're talking about is a specialised sensor and a display, or using the phone as, um, as a way to make use of that sensor. It's a small device, so we've got specialised hardware. We have, obviously, an app that runs on the phone that needs to talk to it to display the result. And the two need to communicate somehow. Um, this is just another example, another <coughs> medical example. So this does um, heart rate and blood pressure analysis and things like that. So you can measure your um, blood pressure periodically and your phone can log it internally. It could, because obviously the phone's got 3G, so it could report it back to some central service. Your doctor could keep an eye on your health. These are really, really cool applications for what is, um, is actually, you know, a very mass market device, but it's being used in quite specific ways. So the equivalent to that Oh, yeah, sorry. A wise man said to me, um, sorry, the wise man is down near the front here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Something along these lines. I think I was rather sleep deprived at the time he said it, so I probably misquoting him. Um, what Android has given us is a much more open platform. And the thing is that I know there are, <laughs> I'm probably going to get heckled for saying that as well. It's not a totally open platform. It ha does have its problems in various, in various issues and various aspects, but um, it does open things up in some very interesting ways. And that, um, the way I see it is that that is a direct strategic 
response to the popularity of the iPhone and the way app developers, the hoops they have to jump through and all the things you have to do in order to develop something, either an app or an accessory for the iSeries. And the answer to this is the Android Accessory Protocol. So if you want to take a device that you've made and communicate with a phone, um, the Android Accessory Protocol is how the two devices talk to each other. Now on the bottom of the iPhone, there's a big <coughs> proprietary connector. On the bottom of a typical Android phone, it's a micro USB connector. So the Android Accessory Protocol runs over a standard USB interface. So it's a lot more accessible. You don't necessarily need to go and buy the custom connectors that'll plug into an Apple device or whatever. So to make this accessible, a little while ago, uh, there was a release of a system called the Android Open Accessory Development Kit. And what this does is encapsulate the hardware and the software that is required to make this stack work into a reference design to make it really accessible. So you don't need a big engineering team and custom hardware and things like that in order to build a device to talk to an Android phone uh, in the same sort of way that you do to talk to an iPhone. Uh, so the stack itself, uh, this is sort of a, a logical representation. So you've got the hardware device, Android device itself, and you've got the, um, the accessory device, which I've got here marked as Arduino for a reason you'll see in a moment. The two need to talk to each other. The line in the middle is USB. So we've got the hardware and then the software stack itself. There are complementary stacks on the accessory platform and on the phone platform, and they communicate by USB. So the hardware itself, at the time the uh, ADK was released, there was the, uh, this hardware reference design, which is based on Arduino. So the board on the left, uh, for just for a scale, that's the size of a, an Arduino Mega. It's like the standard footprint of a Mega. Uh, but this particular one has a couple of extras. There is a USB host connection up near the top, in addition to the USB connection that you connect normally to your laptop or whatever for loading programs on. The USB host connection is what is used for connecting to the Android device. The reason that they released this, and they, they weren't trying to get into the business of selling hardware. So this is an official Google product. They actually made a bunch of these and distributed them uh, to seed this idea. But the thing is, all the design is all open, <clears throat> and it's relatively expensive. To buy this kit, it's about $300, I think it was, uh, and they're really hard to get hold of. The idea was that they were seeding this idea or planting this idea so that people could take this open platform and then re-implement it themselves using other available systems. Um, the demo shield on the right, you don't necessarily need to use. You can put your own shield on it. But that's a little expansion board that has a bunch of I.O. on it. So there are buttons, RGB LEDs, some sensors and things like that. A, I think there's a temperature and a light sensor on it. So the idea is that out of the box, you can have one of these, plug the expansion shield onto it, plug it into your Android device and run a demo app on the device that lets you talk to the hardware. And you can take inputs from it, display it on the phone. From the phone itself, you can control outputs that are on the hardware. So what this does is get you through the first really big hurdle of having a proven baseline system with a phone and a device communicating with each other and resources to modify the hardware so you can update the, uh, the hardware designs to suit your own requirements. Now, the idea is that nobody's going to buy these things and package them up and sell this as an accessory. This is a reference design that you can then expand on yourself. So a couple of things to remember. One, and this is um, one of the things that seems a bit back to front, is that the, uh, the device itself, the accessory, is the USB host, and it charges the phone. So when you plug the phone into your accessory, it's not actually the phone that's the host, it's the, the accessory that's the host. So when you design your device, it has to be able to supply some charge to the phone as well. Where all of this came from was a shield called the Circuits at Home USB Host Shield. This predated the ADK, and it's really what was the genesis of the ADK. This is a shield that implements USB host functionality so that you can plug in various devices. Uh, the idea was that it could be used for plugging in cameras or whatever else you wanted to do, like GPS modules and make them accessible on Arduino. The design for this is what became uh, the core of the ADK, uh, except that the circuits at home is just a shield. It's um, not a complete standalone board, whereas the ADK reference design is a complete standalone board. So you plug it in and it's got the microcontroller, everything is ready to go. Uh, and the idea with the circuits at home USB host shield is you plug it onto something like an Uno, 
So a standard Arduino board, you put it on, and you've got a stack of the hardware that you can use. And that's okay, but um, I know a guy who can like, make stuff, so I talked to him really nicely, and he designed this for me. So this is a, essentially it's the same thing as that circuits at home board that we were talking about just a moment ago, and an Uno squashed onto a single board. So this is a small form factor version of the ADK. So it's, um, it's really handy for lots of projects. So that's what I'm going to use for demonstrations. But enough of the commercial. So the software itself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so a little while ago, while I was preparing for this talk, I did a Twitter update saying, um, Eclipse just decided for me what t-shirt I'm going to wear during the talk. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so I'm living up to that promise. There, if, once you start getting into this, you find yourself in a little maze of twisty passages and they all look the same and most of them end in pits with spikes in them and you don't want to go down there. So there are lots of little things that can trip you up along the way and hopefully the next few minutes will, um, will give you some of the guidance so that you can avoid some of these things that I fell into. Uh, first thing to be careful of is supported devices. This was added in a, um, a release of, well, it was officially released with Android 3.1. It was also backported, and there was a point release of 2.3.4. And this is one of the areas that things get confusing. A whole lot of carriers, particularly carriers that sell like HTC phones um, the, with the Sense UI, were stuck for a very, very long time on 2.3.3, um, and there weren't updates available. So in order to have a phone that could talk this protocol, typically what you would have to do is root the phone, like use CyanogenMod or something like that. And um, so part of this talk was going to be how to install CyanogenMod. And um, Wednesday, no, Tuesday night, fairly late, I was preparing for this talk and packing up all my gear and picked it up and I was walking up to my room and my phone beeped and it said, software update available. I went, yes! So um, on the HTC Desire HD, 2.3.5 came out like two days ago. So that's very cool. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect timing. Um, on a couple of other phones, it's been available for a little while, but that solved my personal problem. So it's, when you start looking at this, it's not immediately apparent what phone you can even use to talk to it. So you need to do a little bit of research. Um, one that is commonly used is the Galaxy S, um, and now the HTC Desire HD with Cyanogen mod, or now running 235 is perfectly fine. The other confusing thing, to, oh, we'll get to this in just a moment, but because it was a minor point release, they didn't actually bother updating the development side software for the identifier. So when you're setting your build targets, what you're actually targeting is 2.3.3, and it lies. So inside Eclipse, it's saying, I'm going to build for 2.3.3, <coughs> and it works. It's actually building for 2.3.4. So what you need on the Android side to develop that software stack is you need Eclipse, the SDK starter package, and the ADT plugin. Um, there is an ADK release 512, so ADK is the Android development kit that you need to install. Um, there is a reasonable amount of documentation for this. It's just a matter of making sure that you get the right versions of things. But if you go to accessories.android.com, there is quite a bit of documentation. This is one of the areas, though, where you, it says to install this, and before you do this, click and go over and read these instructions and do that, and then you go and do that. and then you end up following this path, you end up back where you started and go, I don't know what's going on. You know, it's tip one of those typical yak shaving exercises, unfortunately. But you get there in the end. So on the Arduino side, this is in a state of flux right now. Arduino 1.0 came out not very long ago, and it broke compatibility with every existing Arduino library, including the Android accessory library, the USB host library, and a number of other things. So we're in a state of flux where a lot of people are developing with 0023, which was the previous release, and a lot of people are developing with 1.0. If you go along to the Arduino site now, download Arduino, you'll get 1.0, and it's not compatible with a lot of these libraries. So for this stuff, I'm still developing with 23. However, last week, there was a new release of the USB host library, which is supposedly compatible with version 1.0. I haven't tried it yet, but uh, for now, the simplest path is to stick with release 23. Uh, and also, there is a magic URL there. What you'll find is all of the documentation and stuff online, all of these tutorials and blog posts will say, download the USB host library, uh, preferably version 1, uh, because version 2 has this problem with, uh, with compatibility with 23. 
but the original one does not work and they don't provide this link. So if you've, if you've been asleep the whole time, just woken up and you're about to go to sleep again, that URL is what makes this whole talk worthwhile. So use that one and then it will work so you can go to sleep again now. Yes? The question for the tape was, is there any way we can dim these lights? Uh, I have no idea. No. Sorry. No. Um, slides will be available anyway. Andy. Yes, yes. That's right. That's right. Um, yeah, it might be too confusing. One of the reasons for all of this is that the initial release for the mega style ADK board has support for a whole lot of oh, it's different port mappings to the MCU. <laughs> well, now you can read this and then we'll turn it back on again. <laughs> That's an improvement. <laughs> so, so the reason that there is a patched version is that it changes the port mappings and adds support for the microcontroller that's on the, um, the Uno, the USB droid, and the other um, smaller size uh, boards. So, sensors. Okay, what we were looking at before with the iPhone accessories were, this is going to be interesting. I wonder how we can, let me see. I always set myself up to fail in talks. I like living on the edge. So, and the other thing is it's going to be interesting trying to see this. So I'll see if I can pull this up on the webcam on here so I can show you what's going on. It's going to be very hard to see otherwise. Is there a full screen version? Full screen. Okay. So what we have here is the USB droid. You probably can't see a thing there, can you? <laughs> That's all right? Okay. So it's a USB droid. It has the USB host connection on the top here. There is another USB port here which connects to the host. It's having a lot of trouble focusing. Down here is a temperature and humidity sensor, and over here is a light sensor. So these are two modules that are just plugged straight into the headers on the board. They're not part of the board itself. But this hardware is assembled literally by taking these modules, putting headers on them, plugging them in. That's it. So yeah, you could put that together in five minutes without any trouble. There's nothing special in the hardware there at all other than the board itself, which provides the USB host functionality. So, the logistics of these sorts of demos are very interesting. Um, what I'll do now is power this board up from my one and only USB port. Okay, so it's alive and there is an LED on the temperature and humidity sensor, so it's currently ready to take readings, but there's no way to see it. So what I have here is an Android phone which is running an app that is pre-installed that will talk to this particular device. So I'll bring up that app. Okay. So it's now running the app which is saying, I need you to plug in this accessory. You probably you can't read it there, but it would be saying, please connect the humid accessory. Okay? So this is the USB host connection from the accessory itself. Right now, the only reason that this is plugged into my computer is for power. There's nothing else actually happening there. <laughs> you trust me, don't you? <laughs> All right, so I'll plug this in if I can find it. Wait till it focuses. All right, I'll plug it in. It should detect. And we've now got readings coming from this device. So if I breathe on it, the humidity should go up or down. We'll find out if I'm a vampire. <laughs> it went up. I'm human. Yay. <laughs> And then you unplug it and the device say, on the app says, I need you to plug in the device again. So. How hard is that error handling 
<laughs> the error handling. The design. Is the device connected? Is the framework That's a piece of cake. It's done in the framework. Basically, there's an if connected sort of call. And now we'll get away from that. OK, so a couple of things to check, no, to look for. When you're actually building, um, we might look at the IDE in a moment and see this. In fact, let's look at this. So build target or above. Uh, OK, here we go. This is crazy at 1024 by 768. This is crazy always. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that. OK, so oh no, we'll ignore that one. So a couple of things to look at. This is, these fall into the um, magic things that take you a while to figure out on your own situation. In the properties for the project, you'll have um, Android build targets. And this is one of the things that really tripped me up, and Andy will attest to this. It had me scratching my head for a while. Um, the tempting thing to do is to build for Android 2.3.3. Now, API level 10 is the 2.3.4 release. So the, if you um, are doing a build target of Android 2.3.3, it looks like it should work, and it turns out that it kind of doesn't work. The obscure <coughs> build target you need is Google APIs, which incorporates all of the 2.3.3 core stuff plus the ADK libraries and things built in. <coughs> so just one of those little things you've got to know. Um, now, one of the things that you would have noticed is that when I plugged in the, uh, the device into the phone, obviously, the, well, the app was already running, but it knew that this particular device or this accessory was meant for itself, not for something else. And the way that works is that you have an accessory filter. So when you are um, setting up, let's go into this project. So this is the humidity sensor project. And in resources XML, I believe it is, there is a file called accessory filter. And what this allows you to do is specify a number of parameters. And you can add more. So you can become more or less specific. So you could say that I want this app to grab everything that is the model, you know, droid. Ooh, wrong thing. <laughs> Don't look at that. Um, <laughs> everything that is the model of this particular accessory of a certain version, or you could say any version, or you could um, say manufacturer. You can also check for um, serial number and various other things like that. So you could say, I um, only want this particular thing to work with this serial number. So that will become important in just a second. We'll show, I'll show you another way that works. OK, so distribution. Once you have created your piece of hardware and you have a, an app that talks to it in some way, the question is how to get it onto, that per, onto someone's phone. So it's not, uh, it's not that obvious how you do it. If you want to um, ship a piece of hardware and just have people plug in and have it work, how do you achieve that? Now, there are a couple of different ways you can get apps onto um, someone's phone. The obvious way is through the Android market. Uh, so that's a pretty straightforward process. You just log in, create a profile, pay $25, and agree to terms, um, which don't seem particularly onerous to me. They seem to be fairly sensible, just protecting themselves. So that's one way to do it. You end up with your accessory driver or whatever it is listed on the Android marketplace. Um, the other thing is that you can do a direct download. So you can publish the APK itself. And one of the things that you can embed within the metadata for the device is the URL to get more information about it. So I'll show you that in just a second. Um, the only thing is that you need to allow untrusted sources. So if you want to distribute something that people can install without having to say, yes, I will accept this even though I don't trust it, then you need to have it on the Android marketplace. But for a lot of purposes, this will work just fine. So let's look at an RFID demo. So this particular one, I deliberately do not have the app installed on the phone, and I'll show you in just a moment. So that is an RFID reader that I ripped off my front door. <laughs> Once again, it's another USB droid, and it simply has an interface board on it that connects to the RFID reader, has a relay to drive the solenoid for the door release and all of that sort of thing. So. Let's see how that works.
Once again, we need the connection to the phone, power to the device. Actually, I can do better than this. I feel like I have a little USB power dongle with me. So that way I'm not connecting to the computer and you can see that I'm not faking it. <laughs> okay, so we have the board powered up, we have the RFID reader. It's in a state where it's saying it's red, so it's locked. It hasn't seen any tags that it knows about. I have a couple of tags here. And I have a phone. You've got one up your sleeve. <laughs> Somewhere. Anyone got a scalpel? Uh, okay, so. <laughs> Grant, come on down. All right, so I'll go into applications. Actually, I'll just show you the, um, the plug-in process because that'll demonstrate that there is nothing up my sleeve. So the phone itself is running. There is no app in particular running. Oh, Pokemon. Yes, you can thank my daughter for that. <laughs> so we'll plug in the accessory. And what it's saying, not that you'll be able to read it, is saying, it says, Droid RFID. Open Droid RFID when this USB accessory is connected. Yes. So we'll hit OK. Ah, OK, that was demo fail. I needed to remove it first. Let's do that. OK, so it's uninstalled. And we'll plug it in again. So this time it should come up with a different message. You know, yes, to make you feel seasick. All right, so what it said is RFID reader accessory, no installed applications work with this accessory, learn more about this accessory at blah, and it's got a URL. So click view to go to the URL, and it has just pulled up a link which is actually to my laptop um, using dynamic DNS, and there is a page there with information. So in this, what you would do in this case is you would embed this URL within your device and when someone plugs it into their computer the first time, it'll, or into their phone, it'll pop up saying, go to this website for more information. So you can then click on the download. Nope. I have totally killed that. My connectivity is not what it should be. Oh well, that's a demo fail. There's got to be one in every single talk I do. All right, so how many people came along to the Geek My Ride talk that uh, Flame and I did? Yeah, a few of you. Okay, a lot of you didn't though. That's sad. So, yeah, there's a video. It's too long to show right now. Um, so in the Geek My Ride talk, um, we talked about some of the high tech that's currently in cars, different things that you can do with them. And particularly, once you start looking into the, all of the microcontrollers and things like that that are in modern cars. Now, when I did this talk three years ago, that was an old car. Um, a lot of cars now have 70 or 100 MCUs in them, or many, many more. So what, I, what we showed at the time was a little embedded computer that I had mounted in the boot of the car, connected to the engine management system using OBD2, and wired into the ignition system and the security system for door unlock and boot release and things like that. And it was a machine that's very similar to uh, the Panda board. So it's a little low power um, x86 machine. I think it's running at 233 megahertz, something astonishing like that. It drew lots of power and I needed to plug in lots of accessories. Now the interesting thing about Android phones is essentially this is a far more powerful computer with 3G connectivity with like a multi-day UPS built into it. And now we have a handy way to get data in and out of it. So we can do all sorts of cool things. Um, 
This is the warning that I gave last time though, and I reinforce it now. This is, you don't need to see the detail of this, it doesn't really matter. The point of this is this is part of the schematic of my RX-8. Uh, the part that is dealing with the sound system. So, you know, people mess around with the sound system in their car all the time, change the head unit, put in a different amplifier. You wouldn't think that could do much damage, right? So we've got the main amplifier here. Over here is the head unit, which is the, um, the bit that sits in the dash. And right here is a link to the anti-lock braking system. <laughs> so this is only for the status display. You wouldn't actually kill your anti-lock braking system if you um, did anything nasty to the head unit. But the point is, when you start messing around with web servers that travel at 200 kilometers an hour and weigh one and a half tons, you've got to be really, really careful, okay? <laughs> Nevertheless, being young and crazy, and there's got to be a really cheesy sequel to every, every bad movie. <laughs> So I was trying to come up with examples for Android and um, last night at about 10 o'clock at night, I went out to my car, plugged one of these devices into the ignition controller and a few other bits and pieces and um, had some fun. So unfortunately I couldn't fit the car in the room, so I went out this morning and took some very, very dodgy video on my phone showing it being plugged in. So there is the Android phone sitting on the dash, there's nothing plugged into it at this point. Down under the dash, you can see there's a mysterious USB cable hanging out, and um, that is to, connected to another USB droid which is mounted inside the dash, wired into the ignition system and various other sensitive parts of the car's anatomy. And there's also a gray cable you can see there. That is another USB cable which is providing power to the USB droid. So that's powered up 24-7. There's a big battery pack sitting there that's, a, um, that's recharged when the car is running. Uh, it's basically an external like long runtime laptop battery, but it provides a direct 5 volt output which means that the USB droid can run for ages. So at this point I was fumbling around trying to hold the camera and plug in the cable at the same time and I kept dropping the cable. So I cut the video at that point because it took me about 5 minutes. So the end result is I plugged in the cable and it came up with the user interface which is a series of buttons to control functions around the car. Like um, locking and unlocking the doors which is not that useful when you're in the car. But <laughs> um, you can't hear it now, but there are a couple of things I was demonstrating. Um, in that case, I was turning on the accessory power to the car, so the, uh, the cooling system started up. Um, and you can see there, that was it responding to unlocking the doors. And just in a moment, I'll hit the, oh yeah, that was showing the accessory power. Um, hit the start button, so that um, turns on the ignition and kicks the starter motor. So the car starts up. <laughs> Now, I would feel really bad right now if Jeff did not yell out, fake, from the back. Come on, do it. Oh, you just want, me to, want to make me feel bad, don't you? Man, I can tell by the pixel. <laughs> <laughs> so, if anyone doubts this, the car is parked near the residence up, be, up in PL. It's running. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> And so if anyone wants an actual live demonstration and prove that this wasn't faked, um, I can arrange that during the lunch break or sometime during the conference. So this was all done last night. <laughs> no. Um, I do have to turn the ignition key to drive away because otherwise the steering lock makes it really, really hard to get around the first corner. <laughs> now I'll give away one little secret. Um, the thing is that in, a, in an RX-8, there is an RFID um, receiver mounted just, there's a, an actual coil directly around the barrel of the lock. If you do not have the key plugged in, um, you can't start the car. So I have a spare um, key with an RFID chip, so I took the RFID chip out and it's currently planted under the dash. So <laughs> the car thinks there's always a key there even when there isn't. Um, so basically my car is permanently hot wired. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. This isn't being recorded, is it? <laughs> yes, Angus. If I went down with my phone right now and plugged it into your car, would I get a nice prompt as to how to install the app so that I can start your <laughs> Yes, you would. <laughs> See how considerate I am? 
being live streamed, isn't it? <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh. Yeah. So I'm currently building a larger peripheral as well, um, but I'm building this one out of like bricks and weatherboards and stuff like that, and. You know that I like to go big. <laughs> Anyone who's seen me do these sort of talks before, I'm never satisfied. So this has been a construction project for a long time. As you can see, there are piles of bricks and bits of random capping left lying in, near the front steps and things like that. So this is still quite early stages. But on Christmas Eve, we moved back into the house. Yay, after 10 months of living in the back of the garage. So that was very nice. Yeah, so they flooded. Um, so part of the process of working on the house has been rewiring it from scratch. And there is pretty much not an original bit of wire in the house. We took the opportunity to rip out everything and rewire it. And the way it's set up at the moment, everything is wired back to one of three switchboards. So we have a principal switchboard where power comes into the house and a couple of sub switchboards. This is one of the sub switchboards. So this is the one that's currently off the garage. Currently, it's not gonna move. Um, <laughs> And what you can't quite see right at the top there is there's a 22 inch LCD that's sort of, it's mounted high up uh, for status display. The switchboard itself that's in the middle, I know I'm getting slightly off the topic here, but this is cool, I like this. <laughs> I'm very proud of it. Um, so what we have are a whole bunch of power circuits coming through here. And coming in here are the connections to all of the lights and um, electric curtains and various random things around the house. And the thing is that they are all wired directly back to one of these switchboards. They don't go via light switches on the wall. And each one of those comes down. These two rows here are DIN rail mounted relays. And right down here, uh, so these are the relays, and these are logic level inputs to control it. So the idea is that I can control any load in the house um, at a logic level from something like an Arduino, which just happens to be down in the bottom left corner. It's a little hard to see there. This little box here um, has an Arduino in it, a couple of shields stacked on top with output controllers, and a whole mess of wires that go to these relays. Now, one of the things is that coming into this Arduino, I'm getting even more of a topic here, um, is Ethernet. There's no power going to it. This whole thing is running using power over Ethernet. Um, total sidetrack. Um, I was at Maker Fair last weekend. Man, it seems like months ago. Who went to Maker Fair? Yeah. Yeah, a whole bunch of people. That was awesome. And um, we were running, doing some demonstrations. We had a whole bunch of hardware there. And um, I had a couple of our boards with power over ethernet. And um, I had a little switch and an injector and stuff like that set up. And a whole lot of people were coming along and saying, that's really cool. You, know, you can power it just off the network connection. You don't need anything running to it. And this older guy walked up. And he was sort of looking at it for a while and seemed really interested and took a photo. And then he said something like, um, it's really interesting to see that this sort of stuff is being used at the hobbyist level. It's not quite what we had in mind when we designed it. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? And he said, I work at Cisco. I was on the POE task force as part of the 802.3 working group, and I wrote the reference software implementation for the communications protocol. And my mate designed the hardware for it. So I'm just going to show this to him. And he took a photo and a video and narrated it and said, I'm going to send this to my friend. And so I was complaining about the, um, the price of POE switches and things like that. And he said, I might be able to help you there. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm hoping when I get home from LCA, there'll be a POE switch or something and I can get that into the rack below it. Totally off topic. OK, so getting slightly back on topic towards the end. What we're looking at here, this is um, sort of center lower down within the, um, the wiring closet itself. This thing is a triple E box. I think it's a 201 model or whatever it is. So it's like a one gigahertz machine meant for uh, use as a media player. It's like a triple E PC laptop, but with no screen and keyboard. And that is currently the brains of the house. Um, it's a pretty dumb house. Its brain is written in PHP. Um, <laughs> But that's what it is for now. I can say that. I work in PHP all the time. And 
this is essentially the equivalent to the panda board that Alison was mentioning earlier. So this is my equivalent to what she's running. Um, over on the right there, you can see a blob that um, is meant to be an Android phone. And the idea is that what I'm moving towards is replacing um, all of this high-powered electronics with just a phone. So the idea is that the entire house becomes a peripheral to the phone. <laughs> so, I mean, a phone now is a one gigahertz machine with a bunch of storage and 3G connectivity and everything built in. So um, we can use it for these sorts of purposes. And the, um, the Android development kit that allows us to talk to it from really cheap hardware is something that really makes this possible. It enables this sort of thing. So um, that is a project that's underway. It's not functional right now. But the idea is that the house itself um, will have its own independent internet connection um, through 3G rather than um, just the, uh, the DSL connection that it has now. So it'll have backup connection for itself. Now, there is a whole lot of pain involved in writing the apps that I've just been showing you. And um, I was talking about the mess that the development environment is in. I don't just mean Eclipse. I mean all of the libraries, the different versioning issues and things like that. There are some pretty major hurdles that you have to get across if you want to, um, if you want to create apps. I've been, I don't want to paint this in, um, in an unrealistically positive picture. I could come down here and say, it's easy now to create our own accessories and we've got these reference designs and things like that. But it really is difficult to do this stuff. And um, there is a talk coming up immediately after lunch by Philip Lindsay, who is somewhere hiding at the back. Um, about Handbag, which is a system that um, takes care of a lot of the framework for you. So I won't steal his thunder. But if you want to see a, um, a really easy, quick way to get into this, uh, come and see Philip's talk after lunch, and he'll talk about Handbag, which is specific technology that simplifies all of this. So we have some time for questions and things. Uh, oh, yeah, slides. They will go up um, on that URL sometime, but I'm about a year behind at the moment on uploading my slides. Hopefully I'll catch up very soon. Um, yeah, any questions or suggestions or comments or insults? Can I tell me down the front first before I run into that? <laughs> no? <work> <laughs> <laughs> we do have a little bit of time, so I could just poke around in Eclipse and stuff if that was interesting and show you some of the things inside a project. Um, yes. Regarding your car and all those wires and boxes, have you ever been pulled over by the police and had they've had a bit of a double take at it all? <laughs> Not with that particular car. Um, there was another car I had many, many years ago, which was an RX3. Well, actually, technically, it was a Mazda 808, and I took out the little four-cylinder motor and put a 13B Bridgeport rotary into it. <laughs> and as one does. As one does. Um, the bonnet, like all the hinges had been removed, the, whole, the bonnet was just on clips and it had an air intake on the bonnet. The, um, I took out all of the door locks so they were solenoid released with remote control and remote start as well. This was 16 years ago, something like that, 17 years ago. Um, and I actually smoothed over all of the doors so there were no door handles. So to get into the car you had to walk up with the remote control and click it and the door would go <laughs> and, <laughs> Um, oh, I also took the petrol filler cap off the side, smoothed that over and put it inside the boot, which I've since discovered you're not allowed to do. <laughs> and, and one day I was driving down, um, down towards Dandenong and there was a police roadworthy inspection crew. <laughs> <laughs> and they pulled me over and um, the car looked a bit bizarre. And so the guy said, what is this? Can you show me under the bonnet? So I undid the clips and I like, lifted the whole bonnet off. <laughs> And he started laughing, and then they gathered all of their friends around. <laughs> and I didn't drive the car away. That was very sad. Short answer, no, not with that car. <laughs> a yellow thing, yes. A little canary. Yes. So um, next time there's an LCA near your city, yes. can you run us through a guided tour as one of the official... Events. You can get tickets through Ticketek. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but seriously, if people do want to see this, yeah, that can be arranged. That's cool. Um, Next it, <laughs> yeah, we only had a thousand people last time, so yeah, <laughs> not a problem. 
John, with your home switchboard, you've got everything running back. Is that all mains voltage and were there licensing issues that apply oh, yeah, or yeah. should have applied? Okay, um, to clarify this, it was all done by a qualified electrician. Um, there's a guy um, who I was put onto by Mark who has spent many, many years working on automation systems, primarily um, big industrial installations. Um, you know, the sorts of jobs, like one of the jobs he did was automating uh, the, uh, the maintenance facilities for trains, you know, where they do really long cable runs and things like that. And he came in and was really interested in the project and did all of that side of it. So it's all signed off and approved and done properly. So there is high voltage going to the switchboard itself, which is then distributed via those um, DIN rail mounted controllers to the loads, like directly to the light. So that's all 240 volt. The only side of it I've touched is the logic side, so control of those relays. Paul, I'm just waiting for the microphone. Yep. Um, that actually reminds me of a thing I saw a while ago. Um, and I'm just trying to remember the name of it, and I can't. But um, where instead of having the controller in a switchboard, like a, the relay in a switchboard, you mm -hmm. essentially have the relay on the light and yes. then just run um, cabling, you know, yeah. ordinary phone type cabling to the light. Or wireless. Or wireless. That's, that's quite a common way to retrofit. Is that yeah. kind of thing much more expensive? Is it easy to get? It's you run into the licensing problems because yeah. you need to make sure that the, the ELB, the low voltage control, is rated to cope with the voltage that's actually driving the light fans. That's right, because you've got them, yeah. That's one of my questions, sorry. Yep. Was your logic wiring mm -hmm. actually needs to Needs to be physically to separated. To, well, it needs to be physically mm -hmm. separated, but the insulation on it needs to be rated as the same as the highest voltage available yes. for the next switchboard. Yep. Which comes in, because... What's the currently there is not. Board, um, looks better than mine, mm -hmm. but mine doesn't comply with the New Zealand wiring regulations, mm -hmm. and that wouldn't pass. Yeah, so yep. the, the wiring that's currently in there between the Arduino and the controllers is temporary. Mm -hmm. um, I've got some PCBs yeah, in really Eagle, right, yes. not actually physically existing yet, uh, for the Apple controller that will make all of that nice and neat and cable properly. Yep. Oh, you're saying with the um, accessory protocol that the accessory acts as the host. Mm. Does that mean that the host has to have independent power and you can't have a really portable accessory? Aha, uh -huh. yes. This is one of the gotchas. There are some nasty hacky ways around it. Um, you can fool the host into thinking that, uh, not the host, you can fool the phone into thinking that the device you've plugged in is providing power by doing something like putting a 1K resistor in series with the 5 volt line. So basically you pull the, um, the VCC high on the USB connection weekly, but you don't draw too much power out of the accessory. Um, that works on many phones, but not all phones. And that is definitely a problem. Um, I don't know a simple solution to that. Does anybody else have any, anyone else come up against that one and got a better solution? Nope. Something to research. Grant, did you have a solution to that or a question? The, well, this is the current state of this stuff. But my understanding was going forward that USB OTG is the way it's going to be done. And mm -hmm. that will take away this requirement. Yeah, okay. So that wasn't recorded. The comment was that in the future it's going to be using USB OTG and then that requirement will be taken away. So it won't be a problem anymore. So this is a current state of affairs. I'm interested if uh, you can also control the steering and brakes of the car and therefore remote control it completely. <laughs> yes, that was brought up last time. Um, <laughs> I've thought about that a lot. <laughs> there, is one, there is one fatal flaw with that plan, which is that my car is manual transmission. Um, but if it weren't manual transmission, <laughs> uh, if it weren't, there are probably ways you could do it. It would be nasty. It would stress the system, but you could probably use the power steering mechanism to do it. Um, when people like Mythbusters or whoever do this sort of thing and they drive cars off cliffs, they normally add um, solenoids or some other method of control, like big servo motors, basically, to control the steering. Uh, because the power steering is meant to assist, it's not meant to do the job for you. Like if the car is stationary and there's a lot of, fr um, of friction involved. <coughs> Next question. 
<coughs> Are there any efforts to support this on non-Android phones? I'm thinking like Mamo or Mego, given it's just USB, the, all we'd need is sort of an implementation on the phone. That's a good question. I have no idea. Does anybody know this protocol is supported elsewhere? It can be. It, yeah, you could implement it yourself, but has anybody done it? That's the question. Does anyone use Mego? <laughs> so, <laughs> Marco, you win a prize. No, no more questions? Everybody's too hungry and bored? One more here. Battery backup in your car, was that an easy job to do? How much does it cost? Sorry, the which? The extra battery in your oh, car. Oh, okay, the battery. Um, what I used is a long run battery for a laptop. So the actual device I bought over eBay, it's like a 133 watt hour or whatever it is, external battery, comes with a lead that you can charge it with and another lead that plugs into your laptop and a bunch of adapters. So it's for people that want to sit on their laptop for like 15 hours. Um, that's the whole idea. It's got many times as much storage as a typical laptop battery. You can buy them uh, yeah, off eBay. So all I did was take that and a car charger for a laptop. So I'm feeding the battery backup system with the laptop car charger, which then feeds out the five volts. So I didn't even have to modify anything. I just bought it and plugged it in. That part of it was really easy. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the comment there was you could run off the car battery with a regulator. Um, but one thing I've been really concerned about, particularly with the older computer that sucked lots and lots of joules, uh, I didn't want to come in and find the car flat. So I wanted to, if I didn't go to the car for a few days and the machine was still running and it ran flat, I didn't want to, um, to have any problems as a result of that. Sorry, we're out of time. Lunch is on uh, now, so we'll have to we'll hold questions there. But Jonathan, thank you very much. Thank you. Again, thank you very much for lots of inspirational ideas for us to get out and motorise everything. Um, just before anyone leaves, maybe John will tell us if, if there is a live demo happening at lunchtime, where is that happening? My intention was to do a live demo. The car is currently parked in the car park behind the PL um, accommodation. It's a bit of a walk, unfortunately. <laughs>